thank you everyone for, for uh, coming to this. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. However, I feel a bit superfluous because I'm going to be talking about something which is the broader image of, uh, of, of, of conditions in, in, in the Arab world. And it's something that we probably are all familiar with. I'm just going to show you some data about how terrible conditions were. And I'm sure we're all aware that conditions were not that great in, and, and in essence that some of the things that we were told were going fine prior to the recent political upheavals appear to have been not going so fine. And there is a reason uh, for this. And the reason is much of the uh, inner mechanics of the macroeconomic picture were concealed to, to, to us. So when we were told there were high growth rates, uh, the quality of those great, great, uh, growth rates were, were, was, was poor. Uh, when we were told that uh, unemployment was shrinking, the way unemployment was measured uh, was poor. When we were told that uh, agriculture is, uh, it, it yet, it, it, yes, it's being depleted from its work, workforce, uh, we were not told that the workforce was not being redeployed into other employable positions because the free trade agreement, agreements that we struck as we joined the WTO, most of us progressively, were actually anti-developmental in many respects. So there were many things that, that we could not actually decipher from the broader image. And then many, of course, have come to say that the picture of the Arab world is not a picture of underdevelopment. It is worse than that, and they've, they've actually taken a twist or uh, twisted the, a term used long ago by Rosa Luxemburg, which is, uh, uh, she actually called it decadence, uh, the decadence of capitalism in the periphery. And uh, th th then the term that was used, the twist that was used is that this is rather a, uh, a, a case of de-development rather than, uh, you know, which, which actually is refers to what Rosa Luxemburg re re uh, talked about in her work, which is uh, the decadence, uh, she used the, the word decadence. So I, you know, I, again, I, I feel kind of, because I'm talking about the broader image, and when you're talking about the broader image, you, you're talking about averages, and averages are, one, one is always right when one talks about averages. One is wrong in particular conditions, but on average, we're always right. And the point is uh, to, uh, to actually look beyond uh, these. And, and of course, my colleagues who will talk later will talk about particular conditions, conditions that actually portray the level of decadence or de-development. Uh, let's say that's going to transpire uh, from uh, from uh, you know the the actual conditions that they've seen, the actual conditions uh, of immiserization and poverty that has emerged as a result of three decades of poor development. Uh, we were told that state intervention, macro policies that uh, involve uh, involve uh, public investments that uh, uh, the uh, uh, that the controls on the trade and capital and capital accounts were counterproductive developmentally but now we see um, that also opening up willy-nilly in such a way that we expose ourselves to much more advanced uh, uh, commodified society tends to tear at the very basis of our social structure the economics and the social are not so separable from each other. Once the economics deteriorate, we also know that the social, in a very complex way, also tends to deteriorate as well. <coughs> as an economist, I can show you just some of the things that we, you know, we one measures. I mean, this is the WDI data. That's the per capita growth rate since. 1970, we can see very well that this is an oil uh, business cycle, that it peaks with oil. Then we have it peaked here, that's the first oil boom, then we go since 1980 or so, suffer a crisis as oil prices begin to, to go down. Then we go through a stabilization 
uh, process, this process from here to here is again that just when the oil started to grow again, and then here we have the same thing again going. I haven't finished the data yet, but the data actually here goes this way. We have another bump. But this, from here to here, this whole decade or so, this period was a period in which uh, we have a typical Smithian island uh, uh, growth with, const with constant returns to scale. That means for every person, we, we have a growth with fixed technologies, no improvement in technologies, where the growth rate is actually determined by the population growth rate. So we grow with by one person, we're going to grow relatively by the product of that one person, and given that technology is almost unchanging, or we're importing technology so passively, we are using technology that we haven't actually developed ourselves, so there is no infusion of knowledge in production, so to speak. And that whole period here, we, as we see, is a period of stagnation. It's uh, uh, like Africa's 80s was a lost decade. <coughs> Our, we have more than just the last decade because uh, much of the process is a hollow process of development. Then we, we hit that point here in 2002, and 2002 again we see that we are moving again towards, uh, we could have made gains, social gains as a result of the, uh, the oil runs uh, overflow and the, oh, the, the uh, massive liquidity that has come as a result uh, of oil runs to the region. However, we find that we, these were deployed in a very uh, undevelopmental way as well, and the social basis of society was hollowed as a result of that. So I didn't actually make a, a very uh, sort of stark picture more stark than it really is. But in that period of high growth, since 2002-2003, we have had, for instance, in the case of Egypt, nearly 6%, a 6% growth rate. Yet the issue was is that we were told that things were going fine, that the macro fundamentals, that trade was OK, that our national reserves would cover more than 11 months of import, even nearly two years of imports in some cases, and these are for non-major oil producing countries. And the uh, uh, fiscal austerity was actually uh, keeping our budget more or less in check, budget excesses. Uh, monetary policy was keeping inflation in check because it was also uh, uh, restrictive and not allowing an expansion of the monetary base in area of industrial production. Well, that's a very catastrophic thing in the end, as we will see. So we, we end up having a situation where uh, the only thing that came out in 2010 or 2000, 2010 is that uh, the people who actually check on health uh, children, the children health conditions in the Arab world, were reporting, because we were not, the poverty data was not reported correctly, the unemployment data was not co reported correctly. And oddly enough, in one major Arab report, the report that is published by the Arab League, was producing data sometimes, inflated data, was, was producing data that, that actually did not take inflation into account, that it, and, and it, it was outright falsification of, of, of the image of that, that was there. Then, how, well, you know, something was not going right, because when you read about the development in the countryside, the development in children health, the, uh, those people who were disengaged from the production process, you thought, there's something that struck me which says, in Egypt, after 10 years of growth, very high growth, and this is a country that, that at, the, at the time of very high growth, we, we arrive at a situation where we have one, uh, one child, nearly one child, 30% of children, uh, one child out of three with a case of malnutrition. So that was a, you know, the, the picture that was not so, you know, not so very well uh, exposed to us prior to, and, and of course, if, if, you, if you falsify things of this nature, then of course no policy is going to work. And you're falsifying it because on purpose, you're reifying certain, uh, certain, uh, certain uh, 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 
buzzwords, economic buzzwords like well, the stock markets, the world financial markets, the world interest rates, you give them a life of their own, you reify them, and you base your whole policy on, on these semi-gods that have come from nowhere. Of course, they're the product of social relations, they're the product of power structures, and we have given them a life of their own, and then we said, now we have to follow what the market says. But the market is not a deus ex machina, the market is actually something which is uh, made by people, by human beings, and therefore it, it can be changed by human beings, and it has to work for, for actually for the social benefits of, of, of people, right? So when it doesn't, we have to say that something is going wrong. A market is like any institution, an institution can be flawed. And the market <coughs> was the asymmetries that is found in those markets, and the lack of intermediation between the social and the economic was fundamentally flawed in the region, it seems. And so, uh, so, so we come to a situation where this growth process was a, a pretty uh, 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 pauperizing, pretty dislo a dislocational uh, uh, growth process. Worst of all in this uh, growth process was uh, the shrinkage in, sh shrinkage in the industrial base. We haven't got good data on that because we're in this process of finding out because our countries tend to put mining and oil extraction in, in, with industry in their statistics. So it's very difficult to decipher. I mean, the data is a very complex. The one that we, have, we don't have good data, and we have uh, actually uh, the data is used as an instrument in the ideological arsenal of the people who draw policies in line with, an, with their interest and where there is no intermediation, as I said, in this, to, to allow for social welfare transfer. So if you need, if we're thinking of an invisible hand, somebody had cut off the hand. The repressive apparatus or whatever had cut off the hand. So we, we you know, and, and, and allowed for, for uh, the sort of voracious accumulation that is, uh, that doesn't, uh, you know, uh, do things well, as we all know. I mean, so I'm not going to reinvent the atom at all. But what I'm going to say is, uh, uh, is that from this period here also witnessed a shrinkage in the industrial, uh, in, 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 in the sectors that require, by industry, not, not necessarily, I mean, do I mean manufacturing? Do I mean the, the assembly plant where one imagine uh, is putting together a car part or a computer part or something like that. Industry also can encompass any sort of activity that requires the, uh, uh, the uh, a process of capital accumulation and, and, and a process of transferring, putting knowledge into technology and putting that technology <coughs> into a supply chain, <coughs> an input output process that is multi-layered, as you know, we take uh, the, the, the <coughs> primary commodity, we per, we have permutation on the primary commodity, so many permutations through chemical and industrial processes, and these permutations are value added. The more permutations we have on the initial value added, the more knowledge is going into the production process. That is the sort of industry that I'm talking about. This industry in particular shrunk. Shrunk because the the, the policies on growth were uh, were uh, not so uh, conducive to promoting. Uh, now, at the same time, of course, we have the demographic transition. We know that there's, it's been there for you know nearly the demographic. The, the, if you look at you know, it's not new the demographic transition. Since 1960, the growth rate of the population in the region was about two, 2.5 to three percent. It hasn't changed. It's been declining recently, of course, and with a lower fertility rate, we're, and all of that. But the point is, it's not new, the demographic transition. So there were societies before which had a lower unemployment rate, but were capable of creating capacity, an industry of the sort I said about, through, you know, more, a, a, a bigger government, so to speak, you know. Not a smaller government, not a Thatcherite smaller, smaller government, but a bigger government. A, a, an early labor sort of bigger government, or an import substitution uh, style bigger government, that they were capable of, of matching the growth rate of the population with the growth rate of industry and linking them in a sort of virtuous process. 
with a, some flaws nonetheless. But the flaws that we see now is that we've deca decapacitated ourselves. So you, capacity means this capacity to, to produce things with, because we have an industry that is using knowledge and production. We decapacitated ourselves, and we have had a demographic transition that is uh, maybe it's actually lower. And so and we, all the policies that dealt with, with the issue, dealt with it from the supply side. That means let's educate. Uh, let's uh, 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 build uh, uh, in, in, infrastructure for a certain uh, uh, class of entrepreneur, but not an infrastructure of the social nature. Uh, so the, the infrastructure for entrepreneurship, the financial <coughs> infrastructure was built and all of that, but not the, uh, the infrastructure for the poorer strata of society. So we had a supply side approach to uh, uh, policy-wise, well, so, you know, we all know, all know we on one hand can clap, as they say, you know, we need two hands. So supply alone doesn't do the, the, the work. We need also the demand, but there was a repression of wages. The repression of wages, and the worst of all is the openness of the economies. We know that the accelerator <coughs> doesn't work. I mean, if we, if, you know, no economy is, is going to work if it has huge leakages. These economies were actually have completely opened up so anything you pump into the economy, and it's, 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 it becomes part of the world market, so you have huge fiscal leakages, you lose a lot. Well, unless you sort of restrain you know, the leakages, you make sure that some of the social products, the values, if you like, that you have work for you, work for you and they, you don't educate people to simply you know, uh, uh, go abroad and the, the remuneration and remittances would not pay off for the social cost of having produced so many educated people that have left and so forth. So yes, it is probably a redeemer of the cost of, 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 uh, of emigration, but it's never fully, never fully redeems the cost to society because the monetization of these costs is usually based on a social and power structure <coughs> that and not, I mean, there's no such thing as a free entry, perfect competition. That's, that's a, you know, uh, of course, a, 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 a first book, a first year book illustration, of course. So the point is that I, I want to make is that to, be, to make a long story short, that we have too many people relative to existing capacity. We can't say that we have a demographic problem alone because people alone. If we, if we use that theory, we, we abstract people per se, then we can say the earth was overpopulated day one because there's somebody who had only two fishes and ate the two fishes and one other guy who didn't get a fish or something like that. So, so this theory is everything it must be seen in relation to its surroundings, in relation to how it works with, with, uh, with other uh, components and population must be measured against the growth in the capacity of society to employ. And our capacity to employ was undercut by the fact that we've developed policies that actually shrink our productive base. So if you like, we have uh, this much, this mass of unemployed relative to this uh, productive base that was, you know, almost, they fitted into each other, two jars of the same size. Now we have a much smaller jar in which we have to squeeze this whole mass into. So the criteria that we use from the mainstream line of uh, economics, which says you know your marginal productivity must equal to your wages and all of that, it doesn't apply. Of course, it doesn't apply anywhere. Leave alone that it, you know. But it, it, it couldn't possibly apply here because there's simply too much of a mass of unemployed, and unemployed must be seen in terms of underemployment. Mass of underemployment, and, and and to just to uh, cut to the chase, uh, the impact on the agricultural sector, uh, in particular, was tremendous as well, because the agricultural sector was the most vulnerable sector of all the sectors, because it's the less it it is the most underpriced, and I mean underpriced because prices don't make themselves; somebody makes them, and they they're made not in an interchange between two equal. Two, two 
two people on an equal playing field, they're made between two different power structures. So there are price makers and price takers. And given the political disempowerment historically in the Arab world of many agrarian sectors, agrarian sectors were actually underpriced. And the price <coughs> that we deliver, and the money for that is, the price is the money for it. So that we actually allocated or devolved to the rural sector undercut the value and devalorize the rural sector. And the devalorization of the rural sector acts, the, because accumulation is part economic and part social, acts as, a, uh, as an impetus to the sort of business cycle that we've seen here, which is the growth, the, the, the business cycle that is hollowing, that is becoming, that is anti-developmental, that Rosa Luxemburg called uh, a decadent form of the development of capitalism. And others have called uh, the perverse transformation, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Poliani, Karl Poliani have talked about the uh, great transformation in which people leave the countryside and find jobs and live. Uh, so, but when, when there aren't any jobs, when people leave the countryside and they can't find jobs, so we need something that uh, Rabat Patnaik called the perverse transformation. So we've had decadence, the development, and a perverse transformation. And these are very complex theoretical issues. Now the data on, on investment in the agricultural <coughs> sector uh, shows that in, in, in the last 10 years or so here, this period, I'm talking about this period here, and this is macro data that we have. I don't know how accurate it is, but one can rely on the sources that one has. It's declined from about 10% of total investment to 5% of total investment. I'm not sure of those figures, but it's declined tremendously. And so when you, when you, start, when you stop pumping uh, 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 capital that replaces old capital in the uh, economy, uh, you, you, of course, you know, you, 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 the depreciation rate and the depreciation and all of that eats into the uh, into, uh, and of course, notwithstanding the, the fact that we've had uh, 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 the open trade treaties uh, in, in, in basic food productions and the speculative effects on the financial on food and the financial markets in 2008 and the rise of food prices, all of these factors, of course, combined to create social conditions which are not not desirable in many respects. And uh, the point is, uh, is that, as I said, I'm quite, you know, I, I have the easy job of talking about the bigger picture. Um, the bigger picture one is as right as the data is. Uh, so I, uh, and uh, this is the data that I had so far. This work is in progress. And uh, hopefully I can get some questions to improve on that afterwards. And I, I think I, my time is up, I was told. So thank you very much. Uh,